Well, good morning, folks. This is going to be a fantastic Leading Your Best Life. I'm with David Horlock. We've known each other since the 80s, but we did some fantastic work together a few years ago with his organisation that he was with at the time, BSI, and we're going to talk about that. But I want to also delve down into David's secrets on leadership, management, uh, personal well-being, and, and life in general when we're talking about Leading Your Best Life. David, thank you so much for agreeing to be on Leading Your Best Life. Pleasure, Lee. Good morning. Mate, good on you. And where, where do I find you today? Uh, Singapore, Lee. Singapore, hot and humid, thunderstorms. You love it up there, though. You've spent all those years in Asia, and we'll get to that. And you've got a background there of, is that lavender? What, what's the flower there behind you? Know, you? It's, I think it is lavender, but it could be peas, uh, it could be lupins, uh, but it's just nice pastures, and I'm very much into regen ag, and, you know, that's what a good pasture looks like. Beautiful. Well, it certainly looks very fertile. Well, we'll get to that. Let's start, though, with your journey, the, the David Horlock story, because it is an interesting one, the, the journey where you were born, schooled. Uh, tell us about your journey. You know, Lee, that's a really good question, because one of the toughest questions I get in an Asian context where there are a lot of multinational people is people say, where are you from? Mm. And I say, what do you want to know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to know my hereditary, you want to know where I was born, you try to pick my accent, you know, where do I call home? And people try to pigeonhole you. So, you know, I have four different answers. You know, my hereditary home is English. Mm -hmm. My birth and spiritual home is Thailand, where I was born, and my parents were for 17 years. My family home is Australia, because I went to boarding school when I was eight, um, Guildford Grammar School in uh, uh, um, um, Perth. And then I've spent the last 35 years working in Asia, um, looking after the region and, and having this wonderful opportunity to see rice paddy fields move to sort of super cities, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit about me. You know, English parents born in Thailand, raised in Australia. I call Australia home. I'm in Singapore at the moment. I studied agribusiness. I went to the Middle East. I managed feedlots there for a couple of years, came back, worked for GlaxoSmithKline as a sales rep in uh, good old Narogen. Um, wow. and then, uh, and then I had, uh, five years with elders, which was great, you know, in their, uh, wool and rural merchandise division. And that's, that's where I, you know, really connected with, uh, um, farmers and, uh, became an agronomist, animal production specialist and, and looked at their ag chem and animal health products. And then I moved over to West GS, which was the world's largest testing inspection and quality certification company. And um, I, I took those experiences in the food supply chain, you know, the paddock for plate and developed the cattle care, which became one of the biggest on-farm quality assurance programs in, in Australia to manage high, high damage, bruising, animal welfare and, and, and chemical residues. And then click care, which became a national standard for wool um, and uh, more classing, and then uh, SQF, which became the uh, default supplier qualification program for food safety and quality for uh, Woolworths and Coles that was now purchased by the American Food Marketing Institute and is the number one food safety quality standard in America. So, you know, I was very privileged to be part of the birth of those, those, those uh, programs, which created recipes of best practice for, for, you know, supply chains. And then I moved over to uh, Thailand as a country manager there with SGS and then the Philippines. I had a stint there and then back to Australia and uh, tried my luck on natural beta carotene out in Carnarvon, um, Salt Lake algae, and then back to Hong Kong where I've been for 21 years working with three different companies all involved in supply chain testing inspection certification. And that was a wonderful experience because as manufacturing from Western countries moved into Asia, right, moved into China, we opened up 32 offices there into Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, you know, Philippines, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, you know, all those developing countries and manufacturing moved there, you know, people like Bunnings and Coles and Woolies and Walmart and Tesco and Oshon and Louis Vuitton and all the... Uh, luxury goods and brands that did move their operations. Automotive came later, aerospace, uh, toys, textiles, garments. 
but you were moving manufacturing from highly regulated markets, good government enforcement of labor conditions, environment, you know, quality in countries where the rules and regulations were fine, but the enforcement was very poor. Mm. So my job was finding experts in um, garments, textiles, toys, you know, food, engineering, fabrication, who would then go and pre-qualify those factories to meet the process requirements um, and also to meet the ethical requirements in relation to you know, human rights, modern day slavery, um, child labor, anti-bribery, transshipment, product quality, yeah, you name it. So that was wonderful, Lee. It was really, uh, it was a really um, great experience. And I suppose uh, I had a lot of fun there in terms of developing um, businesses, people um, in a fast moving market um, and learned a lot of skills. No one taught me how to be a manager. I started life as a farmer. Right? Wow. And then I went to ag school and then I, 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 I had a technical job, you know, like agronomy and then uh, uh, selling ag chem products. And then I became responsible for operations. And then one day somebody makes you a manager. And then one day somebody makes you a country manager and then a regional manager and then a CEO. And next thing you think, how did I get here? <laughs> and how did you get there? What do, how do you think you got there? Well, I don't know, because no one teaches you how to do that. I think just, you know, positive attitude, can-do mentality, give 110. I always say give 110. Um, you know, discipline. Um, and empower people. You know, it's all about energy. If you've got a dream, follow it, visualize it, materialize it. You know, share it with people and, you know, work with your people and coach them and bring them along with you. And, and, and if you do that, it's business is really quite simple. People just complicate it. You know, get the marketing right, the sales right, look after the customers and look after your people. And the rest sort of works works itself out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they say, get the yeah. sales right, the marketing right, the people, all those things, which, of course, brings us on, I suppose. I might as well do that, which brings us on to the fact that, one, you and I know each other through our mutual friend, Peter Simons, I think, was he lecturing you at uh, Muresk at the Ag School? Was, is that how you guys met? How did that happen? Yeah, I well, met Simo was uh, um, um, at Muresk and he was lecturing there at the time. And uh, he, the subject he did was uh, the dairy cattle management, it was, was one of them. And he was great. He was one of the greatest lecturers and teachers I've had. I mean, I, I, I still you know, look up to him as being a great, uh, a great communicator. You know, communication is not easy because people want to complicate it. But Simo could always throw in these little nuggets and 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 bring it to life. And I think you know, intelligence is is taking complicated silos of information and and being able to connect them. And and he was able to sort of connect those, which uh, um, was great. Yeah, and he's as you say, energy. He's got that positive can do energy as well. So he's transferring yeah. energy across the lecture theater. That's for sure. Mm. So we, we, we got involved in this. So we knew each other from the eighties when you and Simo were, were even housemates, but I wanted to share going back to the program that we uh, did together. You got me involved. We're talking about looking after your people and empowering people. Let's talk about this BSI sales excellence, sales excellence leadership program. Do you want to talk about what, motivated you what got you again you've already talked about empowerment but what what was the catalyst to get you to say hey i've got to get farnell involved and we've got to do something about sales well it's a good question Lee. you know i started life as a salesperson myself with glaxo smith klein and 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 they did absolutely wonderful teaching right there was technical teaching and there was also sales teaching and we used to get together every quarter um, and that was a very motivational and sort of powering, bringing people together. You learned as much from that sort of uh, um, um, process as all the other stuff, you know, the coming together, the, yeah. camaraderie, the teamwork. And I just felt that today that was lacking. I mean, every organization I'd gone to, people had moved away from the basics of just looking after customers, mm. knocking on doors, following up. And um, um, I I've always been a pragmatist lead. Because I, 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 I grew up teaching very complicated science to farmers. And they're pragmatists. Mm. And they say, you know, stuff the bulldust, 
and, and the technical stuff. Show me how it works. Mm-hmm. And, you know, fundamentally, there's a great saying out there. It says, tell me, and I forget, teach me, and I remember, and involve me, mm. and I learn. And I've always mm. found that I always learn when I tag along with my managers and I go to sales with them and I I, I, I learn by watching and taking mm. those sound bites. Mm. And mm. all the greatest salespeople I've developed, I've done it the same way. I, mm. They tag on with me. You know, it's like an apprenticeship. And I just yeah. found that it was missing. I mean, that was missing. And I wanted to get back to grassroots where I could bring the sales teams in and I could institutionalize them. And I'm a great believer in doing the reps. And that's something you used to say, do the reps, do the reps, do the reps. It's like mm. fitness. It's like health. It's, it's, it's like, you know, it's discipline. And discipline is a mechanism to do the right thing and, 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 and a means of, you know, continuous improvement. And that's what we were missing. We were missing that good recipe for sales training, you know, implementing, measuring, monitoring, and sort of rewarding. So I'd known you from the past and, and, and you were a great speaker. And I thought, well, if I bring the guys in and I do that for two or three years, I can institutionalize it. Right. So I suppose lots of things had failed. I, I wanted to get back to basics. I wanted to involve them, not tell them, not teach them. I wanted to involve them. And I think that's what we did in our programs. We involved them. And you could probably see that in some of the pictures oh, yeah. you got there where we we were, you know, role playing. Uh, I mean, it was very interactive. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was interactive. I'm just trying to go back and find the, there it is there. So, uh, well, that's right. Well, as we go go through, but it was our color zone system that we really institutionalized and, and key messages, but we got them involved through not only in the workshops every 90 days, and there, you know, there was a lot of buddy teaching, buddy learning, doing the reps, reinforcement of all the key elements of the system. And what I particularly liked also, and I've said this to many CEOs and MDs since, is the fact that you and I, uh, partnered at the front of the room where I would talk the 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 system and some of the science and the theory and you would talk how this applied to BSI and we got as you say got we got very practical uh, and and you being able to give real life examples real life current examples of how whatever the principle was I was teaching how it related and of course our challenge was and we always said that the challenge was, Third, across 13 different countries with probably eight to 10 or seven, whatever it was, seven to 10 different languages, Japan, Korea, Thailand, uh, China. We had all these different languages, um, but at the same time, well, India, of course, uh, but all these different languages, but by getting them involved and getting them teaching each other, it just it worked an absolute treat, didn't it? Yeah, I think... Um... You know, to me, as as as, as a senior exec, I, I can't think of anything more important than looking after salespeople because they're the barometer of the business. Yeah. And if you want to take a temperature of an animal or a person, you put a thermometer in your mouth. If you want to take a temperature of a company, just go and talk to the salespeople. Mm. They'll tell you what's happening and talk to them in a way whereby they in a safe environment and they can talk. Yeah, because they're the ones interacting with the customers every day. They'll tell you how to fix your business. They'll tell you what's going wrong. They'll tell you what your competitors are doing better. So if you don't create an environment for them which is safe, yeah, it's very very difficult, right? Yeah. yeah. And I found that I can't think of anything more important than spending, you know, three days a month with the whole regional sales team leaders, right? Interacting with yourself, it's a it's a lot more productive sitting down than doing or reviewing budgets and admin and that sort of stuff this is hands-on stuff at the front end of the business they see it they get empowered they learn um they meet each other and i think the key thing that um um, was the take-home lee is that it created a new language for them you know simple like you know relationship factor you know relationship equals frequency of contact times quality of contact where quality is friendliness times value. You see, I still remember that, you know, and, and mm. it's so, it's, it's so inspirational, but it's just so simple as well. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's just so true. And I think there was another one that you had there, which I quite like was lifetime value of customer was um, the dollars time, the frequency times the duration times 
sometimes referral, but you know, they're really, really good. There's the, the R factor there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, we, we really based so much, as you say, we base so much of the program on just that. Let's get, let's get scientific and systematic about frequency of contact then times quality of contact. And of course, that's where we talked about the color zone system and particularly the POMVIC, the POMVIC system where I'm just, I think that's, well, there's, there, there, there's the desktop calendar, desktop uh, flip charts we had made to reinforce all of those, those yeah. messages yeah. Uh, in the, in the system. And I saw it here before. There it is. There's there. Each country then developed their POMVIC pad to then systematize the use of a quality conversation and of course, then we did the reps. We mm. did the reps so that people practice over and over again to get better and better and better yeah. at having yeah. high quality conversations. Yeah. Now it's all about discipline, about reps, isn't it? You, Lee, you're a great water pilot player and you're a great swimmer, aren't you? But you wouldn't be in the health that you're in and the endurance that you have for swimming if you didn't get up every morning and do the reps. Daily discipline, mate. Daily discipline. And this one here, of course, which is stretching, stretching the comfort zones, stretching. Yeah. Uh, on a regular basis, stretching the comfort zones together mm. makes it easier and easier. So there's yeah. all these metaphors that we had built in. And this one here, which going back to, you know, uh, unconscious incompetence, conscious, inc when I try something for the first time, I realize I can't do it. But then conscious competence, when I start doing the reps, when I do the reps, I become unconsciously competent. I, I don't even have to think about it. And I'm doing, yeah. doing it. So which is exactly what we were doing over that that three-year period in terms of high-quality uh, B2B, B2B sales. Yeah. A bit like what Aristotle said, wasn't it? I mean, yes. at the time, our tagline at the BSI was making excellence a habit. And he yes. he, he, he said, uh, you are what you repeatedly do. Excellence is therefore not an act, but a habit. Correct. We, we said, that's, what, that's what we're talking about, isn't it? Doing the reps. Yep, doing the reps over and over again. And, mm -hmm. and of course... Uh, I mean, we even got to the point, I'm just, I, this is beautiful. This, this interview has got me going back over all my old photographs. We even put in systems where we said, what are you going to do on a daily basis? Let's get some regular frequent training and coaching going on. And again, involving, we'll let the people set their own programs using our formulas saying, okay, you choose which of the drills you're going to use, but, but do something. And here they are. This is Malaysia, but we did this right across every country, got them setting regular deliberate practice uh, sessions within their within their teams. Uh, and in India, of course, I remember they set up a whole academy. Remember they came back, was the, was the name of a, a god of learning or something. I remember that. The Indians yeah. set that up. It was fantastic. Um, well, they so, all took it and sort of modified it. I think Yes. I think the key point is is continuity and and one of the um the challenges is keeping the momentum going here because organizations generally bring training in for one or two years and they drop it they think they've got it then two three years later the yeah. muscle right the muscle memory is gone and you're back to where you are because you know if, yes. you think about it, if you have a sales staff attrition of you know 15 percent What's the law of 72? You know, 72 divided by 15, you're looking about every five five years, your whole sales force is being replaced. So if you're not institutionalized these, these things on an ongoing basis, you get what I call muscle memory loss, corporate memory loss. Correct, correct. And, and of course, what we did and, was set up the train the trainer where we then trained leaders within the organization to then take on board and, and as you say, institutionalize it because there's... Well, that's incredible when you, as you say, use that rule of seventy-two. Uh, uh, you have to you have to plan for that turnover, even though you don't want it. It's uh, the way it happens, isn't it? Yeah, it's a reality. I mean, you know, young people are, are the job hopping all the time in Asia. We call it leapfrogging because you know people jump from one company to the next. It's it's how they get a promotion. Yep. yep. Um, and I have well, no. I mean, you, you, you look at I'm keeping sorry. people as long as you can, but you have to institutionalize that process because as new people come into the into the organization you are de denying them the same opportunity that other sales people had yep 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 exactly and in fact i did an interview with a fellow who worked with jack welsh at ge and that was one of the uh values that jack welsh has is i want you to get people so well trained 
that you then let them loose in other parts of the organization. In other words, rather than I've got a good person, I want to keep them. No, your job is to actually let them move on and therefore, again, institutionalize the coaching, the training, the mentoring. So we're constantly growing, growing people so that managers are coaches and empowerers. And of course, I'm looking, here are some of the, because uh, I've got video of you over the time telling me how things were going. And numbers wise, the numbers uh, in all cases were just fantastic, weren't they? Yeah. Well, you know, Lee, I'm a great believer that, you know, budgets, uh, uh, performance are not about budgets and P&Ls. These are simply means of, 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 of recording. But, you know, businesses are based on strategies. Yeah. Right? And, and, and if you want to um, do something, you always have to have an objective. And then the objective has to have an activity and the activity has to have an outcome and, and sorry, an output and the output has to have an outcome and the outcome has to have an impact. So let me give you a very, very easy example. If we want to feed people, that's our objective, right? So our activity yep. is planting fruit and nut trees. Very simple, right? That's our, our activity. Our output is how many fruit and nut trees did we plant that survived to the age of five and started producing fruit? Our outcome is how much food did we produce? And our impact is how many people did we feed? Mm -hmm. Now, I apply that on everything I do. Mm, Sometimes everybody wants to go for outcome and impact, but no one wants to incubate, <laughs> plant the trees, right? Nurture them to the cotyledon stage, grow them up. That's the bit we're missing. We want instant gratification, instant money, instant profit, and you can't have it. But if you if you get the discipline right, and you focus on activity, the output, and the outcome, the impact will come in time. Yeah, but we've got to give it time. It's like everything; we've got to give it time. And CEOs, you know. Jack Welsh, you're talking about uh, uh, him. I mean, you know, he, he was there for over 20 years. Yeah. 20 years of consistent learning mistakes, learning mistakes, learning mistakes, and developed some great people. I've had a lot of very good GE people working in my business. You know, they're disciplined, they're methodical, they're good people managers. Um, he institutionalized it, but that's hard to do today when you change CEOs every three, four, five years. You've got constant ruptures and changing coming in and their whole line as it comes in with them causes additional ruptures and change the structures and you know lots of uh, fanatics but you know mate uh, it's interesting because he talked about the four e's he thinks it's energy the person bringing good energy and then he talked about energizing people uh as well uh, just it's so it, embedding the, the values, which again comes from training. And this particular guy, Kieran Barr, talked about the academy and the quality of the consistent leadership training, which is exactly what you know you were doing. Uh, and when we were working together um, in BSI, so mate, uh, I, look. First of all, I, I'm not ending the interview, but I just saying thank you for f getting me to to actually find these slides again because I've been sitting on my computer for the last two or three years through COVID and so on. But mm -hmm. this part that, that Michael Lamb uh, said around, we can now decode the success of our best performing salespeople um, because we broke it down and allowed people, showed people how to deconstruct the, pro mm -hmm. the sales process. And as you say, introduced a new language, which in Michael's case, from what I recall, they, I think they grew the sales team by something like 30% or something. So they were undergoing a massive amount of induction and training. So it gave them a structure to scale best practice sales, obviously not just in China, but China was a great example of it. Um, and of course, some of the people he had there, I'm just looking back, I think it was Sophia Wang, the way she took Pomvik and just really worked and trained her people in it was so impressive, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we were also in a, part of the world which was the fastest growing part of the world for at least two decades yeah you have to remember it took the uk 77 years to double its gdp america 40 and china china 20 so yeah. you know i experienced this this crazy um growth over the last 30 years and and you know fast moving businesses we got high attrition you know people moving on um, you've really got to institutionalize things because um, it can get very messy and very complicated if you don't. And I learned from a very young age that you can't manage people, right? You can't mm. put scientific reasoning into an irrational, illogical organism, which humans are. 
but you can manage processes and systems and empower people to take ownership of those. So there's full ownership. So when you're attacking someone, you're not attacking them, you're attacking the process, follow the process. Oh, the process is no good. Okay, fix the process, change the process. Yeah. Yes, which is which is Deming, which is Deming, and of course you guys at BSI, that was the whole thing around systems. Deming's like 94% of problems are due to the system. So stop blaming the people. What is your system? And you go, well, they're not following the system. Well, what's your system to train them and get them to follow the system? Yeah, absolutely. Everything comes back to the system. You know, as an agriculturist, I remember in, in, in my early consulting days, I'd go out there and I'd get, you know, 20 farmers together and I'd say, you know, what are you guys doing? They said, well, we're farming. And I said, well, some of you are doing a tonne per hectare and some three tonnes per hectare. Look up the sky, it's blue, the rain, the clouds, the soil. It's all the same. But mm -hmm. you've got huge variability in your performance. So I set up a three ton club and then a four ton club and I applied that to horticulture products, grain, you know, meat. And all I did really is had farmers teaching farmers to create the best recipe possible, which became the standard they all put together and increase their profits three, 400%. Oh, beautiful. Mate. That so which you is that... that if you look mm. at a franchise organization is a really good example. Franchises are small businesses but their success rate is about five times greater than the equivalent small business. Why? Because they're following proven recipes. Yes, yes, which is our CBP, collective, mm. collective brain power, but as you say, combined best practice by, by yeah. capturing best practice, um, which again, which is one of the, one of the tools that we, we created there, which was that, uh, that booklet, where, well, not only the booklet, well, there it is there, that one there, the embedding sales habits. Uh, remember that book we captured at least 20 of the best practices. Uh, yeah. And then when we when we took that to Europe that time and the, the, the here it is that the, there was just 20 uh, in that in that booklet and the Europeans go, what the hell, how long has this been going on? You know, CBP, collective brain power equals collective best practice. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just worked and worked an absolute treat. And again, systematizing the sales process uh, and how that then linked in with the CRM so that we didn't lose didn't lose the data, which again is all again part of systematizing. And then this, which was your initiative, around the, the heat maps to go who is actually following and in, and implementing the uh, the best practice and who isn't. And now let's coach those people and work with the managers to make sure that happened. So, and of course here, this is a great this one here. Our Indian friends who love to share best practice and what they were up to. But again, that was part of the forum, wasn't it, where we created every 90 days, uh, not just looking at budgets, but beginning to share best practice and uh, how we then cross-sold and learnt from various countries as to who, what was what was going on in Japan that we could use in India, what was going on in Thailand that we could use in, in you know, Korea or other places. So uh, comment on that in terms of that, CBP, the way we, we did that every 90 days? Well, I think, you know, we came up with that. I think that was an acronym that I think it's the first acronym I've come up in my life that was actually my own. But uh, collective brain power was basically bringing people together every three months and collective best practice was a, as a result of collective brain power, bringing yeah. people in and learning from each other, you know. So that's yeah. why we came up with the CBP called CBP. Yes. Um, and, then, uh, and then we started monitoring that because, as you said, if you don't, um, if you don't follow up and, and and measure and monitor, you don't institutionalize. So uh, everybody had to report on that. And then we also, um, they developed their own matrix and uh, they put up their own television screens in each of the office. And it was like a bit like a race, you know what I mean? So they would actually put each other's results up there. And that wasn't, it, it was competitive in nature. It was fun. It yeah. wasn't there to ridicule people, but more to help people and then, you know, celebrate the success of those that, that had, had had achieved well. So we had individual KPIs, group KPIs, and then the country sort of KPIs. And that was very inspirational. You know, they'd get a big win. It would go up on the screen, the bell would ring, and you create a bit of excitement in the office. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. And mate, but that was just, you know, reinforcing the positive behavior of, of, of camaraderie and, 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 and teamwork and working together and celebrating our successes. Yes, yes. And as you say, numbers wise, I, was it three years of record sales? I can't remember. What, were the, what, was the, what was the outcome of all of that? Well, I can't remember the figures uh, mm. 
be, but it was a significant increase, well over hundred percent, and then it, it sort of you know slowed slowed down a bit. But you're talking about percentages, which are very dangerous because the mm. the absolute number is 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 sort of doubling. You know, if you get a hundred percent, you right, you're doubling, so you so your percentage yes. less. But all I can say is that they were probably some of the best times I've experienced in terms of the money that we spent, the camaraderie that we created, the energy and enthusiasm. And we had everyone singing on the same song. You know, when I yeah. first came to the company, there were 13 different ways of presenting the company. Yes. No core collateral, no core marketing. And you can go to any organisation I've been to. The first thing I do is go around all the countries and I get to say to them, present to me the company. Mm. And I quickly realised there's 14 different ways of doing it. Mm, mm, mm. And if you want to be a global brand, you have to be singing the same song. Right? Now, I'm not saying you don't localize, but you've got to have a pitch. Yes, yes. And, and there's going to be best practice. Some countries are going to do, you're going to say, hang on, that that we need that being said in other places as well. Mm. Yeah, so I had a thing on core collateral, and then we had to present to customers in a certain way. We had to give our proposals in a certain way. And then I introduced what I call a mystery shopper, which is probably one of the best things whereby you get a mystery shopper asking each of the countries for a quotation in specific products and then looking at what was the response time, what was sold, was there upsell, was there a cross-sell, um, what was content that was sent, you know, did they follow the instructions? Yeah. <laughs> and Lee, that doesn't lie, you know. Yeah. Customer surveys are not very good because... People that are so disappointed and upset with you, they don't fill in surveys. They don't waste any more of their time. <laughs> yes, yes. I yeah, don't know. No. Uh, giving what, like, as you say, what's the experience? And then the mystery shopper uh, can give you a whole lot more data than just someone ticking boxes in a survey. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, we used to present that back to the guys. So some of the managers were, you know, hiding under their chairs. Others would yeah. jump on the chairs and celebrating. But it was yeah. just, just fun because it's, it's mystery. Yes, you know? yes. Three countries said, oh, we don't respond to Gmails. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. So these days, David, uh, what, what are you doing now? Because you're not with, not with BSI. You moved on from there. Um, what, what, what are you doing these days? Well, Lee, I'm at that stage in my life where, you know, I've, uh, I'm sort of enjoying it now and I'm doing a bit of um, advisory work. So I sit on a couple of boards. And um, there's a number of um, um, advisory companies out there, you know, the big global ones, where I have a bit of a niche in terms of, you know, ESG, sustainability, supply chain, you know, coaching. Um, and they're always looking for seasoned experts that, that have had that hands-on experience as well. So when they go into their customers, they're not just talking textbook, but they're actually talking about people that have uh, implemented um, whether it be supply chain resilience or whatever. And I think, you know, one of my uh, um, um, greatest learnings from, you know, great companies like BSI and SGS is that we're always there at the um, the leading edge of critical global issues, whether it be ESG or environment, or health and safety or modern day slavery or anti-bribery or diversity and inclusion or well-being in the workplace. You know, I've seen standards move from product quality to process quality to behavior quality and we wrote the rule books for that and certified the first companies in the world in all those standards so there's an awful amount that i feel that i can actually give back yes yes, um, yes. to organizations on critical boardroom issues and that's something i just love doing um yeah. so I'm, I'm getting a lot of fun with doing that lee so i, I would say you know a, advisory work sitting on a number of boards and uh, um, getting that lifestyle balance and work to the appropriate level at this stage of my journey perfect mate now i was thinking uh you've always been a person looking after mind body spirit and energy and i will never forget that day at the top of it was i think it was in uh bangkok where we because we swam every morning before we then ran the workshops together and I remember one day you said lee i don't think you breathe deep enough I went, what is he talking about i breathe i do all this swimming but uh because since i've since been doing yoga and uh, meditation and a range of things that i wasn't doing 
back in 2017 and 18. But would you like to tell people about your journey with yoga and and your own personal maintenance, personal health, mind, body, spirit uh, discipline? Well, as an agronomist and animal production specialist, I've, 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 I've been looking at plants and animals all my life, and I see that all the illnesses we've had in animals, we get in humans 20 years later, right, when we bring them indoors, every single case. Wow. Right? <laughs> and um, there's one great Greek philosopher once said, um, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. You know, today we are saying, you are what you eat, eats. You are what you eat, eats. Not you are what you eat, you are what you eat, eats. Right. We at the end of the day, we're organic matter because 98% of the calories on this planet come from the first six inches of the soil. So, Lee, I'm sorry to say you are just organic matter. I'm organic mm -hmm. matter. Today we eat a banana, tomorrow you're a banana. Today we eat an apple, we eat a steak, we eat dairy products, tomorrow that's what you're made of. Mm -hmm. right? So our food ecosystem can only be as healthy as the soil. It takes 100 years to produce an inch of topsoil, 10 years of cropping to get it to zero, yet we give it no value. Yeah. That's why we're going to regen farming. So I'm very conscious what I eat. And there's a big debate about don't eat meat and don't eat dairy and don't eat this and eat veg and eat that. And at the end of the day, you can go and look at the biggest meat eaters in the world, whether they're the Eskimos or the um, you know, Maasai or whatever, and you find there's no coronary heart disease. There's no diabetes. So where's this coming from? It's coming from processed foods. It's not coming from meat or veg. You know, eat what your ecosystem gives you. If it's nuts and fruit and 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 grain and a bit of meat, fine. If it's fish and it's it's dairy, fine. But we've been living this way for years. Just don't process it, right? Just go for natural food and make sure that it's grown in the most natural way possible, where you're getting the proper nutrients from, you know, nutrient rich soils, which have been well looked after so you know one is i'm i, I eat a gluten-free diet I, I eat lectin free diets and and i eat low gi i have a big mix and i don't eat a lot of sugar because sugar is just bad for the body the human never evolved with sugar right so low gi to start with i exercise an hour every morning do my yoga do my military exercises resistant exercises um and then I do my breathing. So I always loved diving as a kid. So I can hold my breath mm. about four and a half minutes. Mm. And um, I do a lot of breathing because it it's you know, it can reset your central nervous system. Um, I remember the very short lesson I gave to you in a 20-minute period, I enabled you to double the distance that you could swim underwater. Yeah. Right? So it was just technique. And there's a great book called Breath. And yes, I'm reading it. I've, I've listened to it and I'm now reading it uh on my ipad yes yeah it's called the lost of an ancient art mm. the greatest correlating factor with longevity of life is lung capacity wow that's a big one and we only used to breathe five times a minute today most people 15 shallow chest breathing you look at a baby in a cot its tummy goes up and down when we get older we're told to stick our chest out stick our stomach in <laughs> Go back to using your whole body. You know, most of us are only using around 30% of our lungs. Because yes. the more you breathe, the more you're going to oxidize and you're going to rust and you're going to die. Right? So the less you breathe, you'll slow down aging. Wow. It, wow. It, 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 it's, 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 it's as simple as that. So that, you know, plenty of antioxidants. So antioxidants are Mother Nature's um, um, uh, sunblock, right? So if you look at natural beta carotene, Right? It's called carotenoid. It's 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 the algae that flamingos eat. Flamingos are born white, but then they go red. Right? That's what you call an antioxidant. It stops your body from rusting. So right. antioxidants are things that are in like things like watermelon, blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, anything that's red. Eat red, 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 red. So let me explain. When the autumn leaves come and autumn comes and the chlorophyll on the leaves disappear, what do you see behind the chlorophyll and the leaves? You see the red and the orange hues, don't you? Mm -hmm. They don't just appear. They've always been there. These are carotenoids. And they're protecting those plants from dying and from sunlight, the ultraviolet wow. rays. So your body is no different. That's why they say eat the reds, eat the purples, eat the antioxidants. 
Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, you know, do the reps in the morning, eat healthy and cut out on the sugar. And sugar is things like flour, cakes, gluten, processed food, mm -hmm. sugar, cornflakes, anything that's processed. Well, you be, you're a great reader and you put me onto that other book, Grain Brain. Was yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Because that was just fascinating. The, the author was, I think, a, new, a neurologist and a dietitian or something, wasn't he? Um, yeah, well, he that... was a brain surgeon and he was noticing that, you know, there's there's a massive uh, a hockey stick uh, growth in dementia and Alzheimer's, which we never saw to the degree that we see today. And he believes that a lot of that was driven by excessive gluten and gluten comes from our, you know, predominantly grain diets. And uh, we're not, you know, eating the ancient grains that we did years ago, like, you know, buckwheat or millet or sorghum or, you know, some of the uh, 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 ancient grains which are very low in gluten or no gluten at all. So, you know, our bread is predominantly wheat, it's predominantly barley, that's full of gluten. The plant breeders go for yield, so you, you, you actually produce more gluten. And according to his book, you know, that causes inflammation of the brain and it's subclinical. So you don't see it until you've actually got the diseases of Alzheimer's and dementia later in life. So, you know, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know. I, I personally think it's right because we move from um, um, high fat diets to, 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 to um, low fat diets now and high carb and people cutting down on meat. And, and we've got all these health issues that we didn't have when we were back in the you know 60s 70s where we had the meat and free veg mm, mm, mm. And, 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 and it was all whole food you know so i think you know go back to wholesomeness and you see that coming back today you know food equals pleasure which is taste trust and meaning i think a lot of uh you know restaurants are going back to natural less processing more wholesome yeah and that's yeah. a good turn yeah, that's a good change. And I think, you know, you just look at people that exercise well, that, 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 that you know, get their body, mind and their diet right, and they're happy people. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, well, we talk about, you know, you live in two worlds at the same time, the ex external world of what we see around us and people around, but the internal world, the internal world of, you know, thoughts and emotion, but internal chemistry. And of course, if you're putting in a whole pile of sugar or a whole pile of caffeine or a whole pile of coca-cola or a whole pile of bread that's going to change the internal chemistry uh mm. and and uh, have all sorts of consequences in terms of up and down uh your blood sugars going up and down uh feeling lethargic uh of course the breath that book breath where he's talking about breathing through the nose which again you would have been aware of it through yoga but my yoga instructor said, well, Lee, what we know is breathing through the nose reduces cortisol levels so versus, of course, breathing through the mouth, you, you don't have anywhere near the level of protection of uh, bugs or bacteria as you do breathing through the nose. So I've been sleeping with my with my mouth taped for the last six or more months. I've got to say, I've had sleep apnea and used the sleep apnea machine for years, uh, but the tape, the th roll of three dollar tape, I think is doing a way better job than the sleep apnea machine. And I'm breathing through the nose versus breathing through the mouth. So you know, the East, the Indians and people in the East have known for thousands of years about the the, the importance of breath. And I, as I said to my yoga, I did a podcast with her, my yoga instructor last week. I mean, these guys were sitting in caves for the last five and 10,000 years, practicing and experimenting with breath, sleep, exercise, mind. So isn't it crazy how it's only in recent times, when I say recent, you know, let's say the last 50 to 100 years, People have paid any attention to what's come out of those caves in the in the well, east. Of... You know, you're quite right. I, I I often say that you know the most common things that people do in the world were the most illiterate on. You know, number one is understanding of food, just understanding basic food. You know, low mm. GI, high GI, gluten, sugar. People just don't get it. Mm. You know, if, if you put white bread in a glass and you put pure sugar in a Mars bar, which one you think is going to dissolve the quickest? I'd imagine the bread. It's a white bread, right? So yeah. That's, yeah. So that's called gluten, and that's that's sugar. Mm, mm, mm. You don't see it that way. It's sugar, right? Um, so that's that. The next one is breathing, the most important thing in the world, and we don't really understand it. It's terrible. You know, in ancient times, breathing through the mouth was taboo. Even the American Indians, when the children 
had been breastfed and after that, and they started breathing, if they breathed through the mouth, they would pinch their mouths. Teach them to go through the nose. Wow. And during that period, right, um, all the skulls and things that they've actually collected, they've seen there's there's less cavities because you've got less oxygen going and feeding the sort of the bacteria and the decay and so forth. You actually change the pH of your body as well, right, which... So you end up with less disease. Yes. Right? You've got a better um, acidity pH in your body. So you've got a better immune system. And then the other one is exercise, right? As human beings, we don't walk anymore. We don't do anything. Everything's remote. We sit down. So we simply get overweight and obese purely and simply, as Robert De Costello said, it's very simple. Move and burn more than what you put in your body. It's as simple as that. Absolutely, absolutely. And now we're talking about some of the books you read. I know I like to say to people, leaders are readers. And I, no matter where I go, I love to ask my guests, what books are you reading at the moment? And what are some of the most powerful or profound or influential books you have read so we can recommend some things to people? So what are you reading at the moment? And then let's talk about some powerful books. What's what's by your bedside table or in your office or wherever you do your reading? And not only that, your reading routine. Do you do it in the morning, at night in bed, at lunchtime? Uh, how, do you, how do you go about it in terms of your reading system? Okay, Lee. Um, listen, with regards to management books, I think I've read just about all of them. I, Probably my favorite was e -Myth Manager, and the other one was Simon Sinek, Leaders mm -hmm. Eat Us. And the reason I really love that is because it resonated with my sort of management style. In actual fact, one of my country managers sent it to me and said, listen, you've got to read this book because it's you. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. <laughs> and, uh, the essence of that, it's, it's, it's a lot about what we've spoken about, creating a safe environment for people, empowering people, looking after people, and you know, keeping business simple, as we said, you know, marketing, sales, strategy, plan, and and if, if, if people are in a safe environment, they'll perform well, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So I really love that because I, I, I sort of uh, think that, you know, if you get the culture um, and you get the values right um, and then you implement a good strategy, it'll happen. If you have a good strategy but you don't get the values and the culture right, um, it won't work. Mm -hmm. And it's not what you say. It's how you act and how you behave. So I really love that book because it's very much about behavior. Um, the last one I read was, you know, The Kings in Shanghai. It just happens to be on my sort of shelf here. Okay, great. The Last Kings of Shanghai. So that's a great book by Jonathan Kaufman. And, you know, I've lived in Asia all my life, but I've never heard of this book. And I read it and I was fascinated because it's about these Baghdad Jews that moved to um, Shanghai, the Kaduris and the... Sansoons and you know how Shanghai was you know the uh, uh, place to be it was you know the the area of, of 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 culture economic growth everybody was aspiring to 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 be successful as uh, Shanghai and um, so that's a really fascinating book about Shanghai about Hong Kong um, those great uh, family empires um, in terms of literature, you know, Man in Moscow is a really great read. Crime and Punishment is a real spiral novel, and it just keeps twisting and twisting and twisting. In terms of facts and history, I love Factfulness by Han Gosling because it talks all about how the world's a much better place today than what we think it is, but we're clouded by, you know, social media thinking. So that's a fantastic book, Factfulness. The other one, History of the World in Six Glasses, fascinating. History in Six here. Glasses, yeah. yeah. History yeah. of the World in Six Glasses, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. um, yeah that's a fascinating book. Um, yeah, about coffee, tea, um, you know, why beer was invented, wine. Um, in terms of food and, and, and natural history, you know, Empires of Food is a must read because, you know, all civilizations are built around food. And if we don't have food, we don't have security. And if we don't have security, we don't have national security. So great examples of the fall of the Egyptian Empire, Roman, uh, the Khmer Empire in, in Cambodia, the Incas. Uh, when we run out of topsoil, water, and monoculture, we disappear. And that's where humanity is today. So that's why things like regenerative agriculture and getting our 
food production system back uh, in process is so important. Man on Earth by John Reed is a fantastic book about 16, 17 different uh, um, tribes and cultures around the world. Salt, fantastic, fantastic, just salt, just the history of salt. It was uh, um, the Roman word for salary, right? It was worth more its weight than gold. It's wow. what people were paid in because in an era when we didn't have refrigeration, the only way we could preserve food was by salting it. Yeah. 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 Uh, Grain Brain, fantastic book about health, you know, gluten, um, um, plant paradox, another great one about lectins and, you know, vegetables that we shouldn't eat, the Omnimore dilemma. So, you know, I love all those types of books. Fiction, Relax and Dream, great Wilbur Smith fan. Read them all. Uh, <laughs> Bryce Courtney as well. You know, another great, um, I think he's, he's a South African, I think, but uh, um, um, migrated to Tasmania. But, you know, great books on Potato Factory, Solomon Song. Yeah, he's uh, a great author, Bryce Courtney. Yeah. Tom Owen Hall. I've got a new Wilbur Smith one that I'm hoping to read when I go on holidays next month on The, the Testament. So I think that's a sequel that follows The River God and... Uh, um, um, you know, the Egyptian series that he had. And then um, probably finishing off on documentaries. You know, I love, you know, natural documentaries. Uh, you know, Kiss the Ground is a great one. It's it's about where our food system comes from, you know, Kiss the Ground. Wow. I, people would be fascinated by that. Um, it's about healing our land and, and, and getting back to regenerative agriculture. Uh, fantastic fungi. Great book about the importance of soil. Um, Heal is a great spiritual um, documentary, just about self belief and how you. Is it called Keel or Heal? Did you say Heal? H E A L. Heal. Okay. Heal. Okay. Very and very simple, but fantastic book for anybody that's going through, you know, trauma with loved ones, and it's just about the power of the mind, how it's the greatest, you know, chemical factory in the world. Yes, uh, and the other one is the secret. You know, the, just the secret, right? Mm. It, it, it's a great book as well, but just about um, if you visualize, it will materialize. It's about self self belief. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So I suppose that sums it up. Yeah, mate, you. Well, I can see you running a Dimmick's bookshop or a, a book uh, in your old age. I mean, goodness gracious, you just you are a an encyclopedia of, of what books to read. So again, I love asking people who are great readers, what is your reading routine? Uh, when do you do it in the day or in the week? Uh, and do you have a place in the house that you tend to do it? Give me your reading routine where you've clearly set time aside to, to read, let alone attitude to reading. So let's start with where do you do it in times of the day and week that you do it? Lee, that's such a good question because the answer is, is that my, my rhythm is broken like so many of us, is that we are um, overridden by this thing. Yes. And we're connected with that, and I suppose we we use that for everything, right? For um, if you have an inquisitive mind, you're always searching for things. Like we read the news there. I, I love reading The Economist. I have it on my uh, – um, I get the hard copy, but I've also got it on on this phone. And that takes a lot of that time that I used to have on a, you know, Saturday, Sunday morning, sit down with a cup of coffee, relax, put your feet up. You know, there was no phone and that's when you can get into your books. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? So I miss that time and I'm trying to, I am working hard to um, try to fill that gap, right? Because once I start a book and it draws me in, it's very difficult for me to put down. So I just find a way of finishing it. You know, but I love doing it around the pool, lying on the couch, you know, um, in bed. Fantastic, mate. Right. So leaders are readers. And you, the number of times, pretty much every time we get together, you're telling me of, of a book. Uh, and as you've mentioned, Grain Brain so many times and, and uh, Empires of Food, uh, just fantastic books. And I think you've mentioned Sapiens at one stage. You were fascinated oh, Sapiens, with Sapiens, yeah. Sapiens is another favourite. Sapiens, Dark Emu. Dark uh, Emu, yeah. Homo Deus, that was that was a bit hard. Not as good as uh, um, Guns, Germs and Steel or Sapiens. I put them. Um, That's right. You've mentioned those before, yes. Those, but, yeah. Mate, incredible. Well, actually, another great one, if you're a sportsman like you, yeah. is Born to Run and Why We Run. 
Oh, okay. Why run and why we run. Wow. Absolutely fascinating books about why humans and we actually used to run after our prey. Yes, of course. Um, if you couldn't run, you weren't going to eat. Yeah, and then why we run? Just, just, just mindless. And uh, you talk about the Tamahara Indians who live in the Copper Canyons in Mexico, and they think of our marathon as a warm up. You know, they run a hundred miles, and they've actually raced them against horses. Right? <laughs> and the Tamahara Indians win. You know. And, uh, and you got these, you know, 70 year olds coming up the hill after they've done like a, you know, 60 kilometer run. And people say, how do you do it? And they said, no one told us we couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, talk about paradigm, paradigm busting. It's, it's Roger Bannister in the four minute mile. Once once he'd broken it, then a lot of others broke it. But it's yeah, like, it well, 70, it was 17 people the following year. Yeah. Yeah, isn't it incredible? Okay. When you show what's possible, what's possible. Mike, thank you for that. Um, you've inspired me to do more reading. And do you listen to things on Audible? I know you, You uh, what's that uh, Blink, Blink? Uh, what's that one, that Blink? Oh, Blinkers. Yeah, Blinkers is a great one if you don't want to get stuck into a book. Because I'm one of those guys, when I start, I don't want to finish. And sometimes I've got to go through just, you know, agony. Um. Some books start slow, start very fast, and 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 uh, keep you cap captivated, and then they just drag on for an extra 150 pages, which probably isn't needed. Yeah, amazing, uh, amazing. So Blink, Blink is, is a really, really good if you just want a top level summary. Yes, no, no, you you put me onto that, and that was fantastic. The the number of points and inspiration you can get in a very short period of time, uh, super super efficient way of getting uh, ideas and information, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, audio is great for books, which just, you know, small print on a page, lots of facts, lots of detail, and it's just difficult and it's full of facts. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes, you know, it's it's a lazy option. Yeah, yeah, great. Right, well, they're all great books to recommend to people. Let me ask you this question, though. Um, what motivates David Horlock and why? Attitude, I suppose. Attitude's a little thing that makes a big difference. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by attitude? Yeah. Well, attitude is just being positive about life. You know, there's three mm. things. I lost my father when I was 17. My mother had a stroke two years later when I was 20. And then I was, uh, we lost everything and I was stuck there. You know, where do I go? So I either felt sorry for myself or I sort of just moved on and I moved on. And, and, and my mother was a great aspiration. I always said, when you fall down, get up and just keep going. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's persistent and and I think you know three really important things in life. Number one is everything in the world is made up. Only history will tell us whether we're right or not. Mm -hmm. But we used to think the world was flat, but it was round and they wanted to kill the poor guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So one, everything's made up. So you know, get your ideas and then try try to find the crew that want to believe in your ideas so what i'm saying don't doubt yourself so everything was made up number two no one's in charge which means you're in charge mm -hmm. number three life wasn't meant to be easy mm -hmm. right? and then when you accept those three things you don't have to be the victim yeah but just get up and just get going. And, you know, I, I love leading people. I love, I'm quite sort of, you know, competitive. I, I like working for organizations that are purpose-led with impact. Um, I like developing and growing people and taking them with me and leaving a sort of a legacy. And just being a good human being, Lee, you know, just, just, just you know, following the principles of, of very, very simple principles, which are all religions around the world is, just treat people like you want to be treated. It's as simple mm. as that. Mm. The golden rule, the golden rule. Yeah. And David, what does the future hold? What does your future look like if I'm going to say the next two, three, four, five years? You've kind of touched on it, I suppose, with the board situation, but just want to elaborate in terms of where, where you see things flowing over the next few years for you. You know, it's funny when you get to this stage, you think, shall I retire? Shall I stop? And then I was trying to invent a new word for retirement, which didn't mean retirement because retirement to a lot of people is a death sentence, right? Yes, yes, yes. And I don't like, I don't like the word because it means you stop, you grow old, you give up, you have no purpose, and then you die. Mm. 
And um, I got on this wonderful podcast. It's called Exponential Wisdom. It's one of the top five podcasts in the world. And there's a couple of 70 year olds on there and they, you know, talk about life and moving on. And, and you know, there's some very profound things there, um, Lee, that I like to share. And one is that, you know, when you get to this age, you're smarter, you're cleverer than you've ever been in your life. You've made mm -hmm. all your mistakes. Why would you want to stop? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's one group that says, I'm going to retire. They say, how long are you going to live? They say 80. And you know what? They all die at 80. Yeah. There's another group that says, I'm going to go on to the next phase. I'm smarter, you know, purpose. Um, maybe you're not hostage in an organization, but you're doing it because you want to do it. And they go on and live an extra 25 years because they got purpose. So for me, yes, the venture and the journey continues. Um, I'm in a transition moving into um, um, advisory and uh, or a base retainer with, you know, two or three companies up there at a strategic level sitting on boards. And uh, a bit of travel and enjoyment. You know, I love travel. I love history. There's just so many things on my bucket list. And when I look at them, I think I'm going to run out of time. <laughs> well, it sounds like a full, but well balanced. I agree. I mean, I can't see myself retiring. And, you know, you know anyone can tell listening and watching you, the energy. I mean, you're not going to sit around coffee shops looking at the ceiling, reading right. the paper every day. You're going to be you're, all the, all this knowledge and all these skills and experience. And as you said, you love leading, love empowering, and 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 leaving legacies. So, uh, mate, there's just so much. I'm just looking at my notes here. Everything from recipes for best practice, the power and importance of purpose, doing the reps, giving 110 percent. As you say, involve me, involve me. Make it safe in sales for that front line to be giving you the intelligence and feeding back. Um, tagging along as teaching. You know, the, every 90 days, get that team together. The whole importance of institutionalizing sales systems and sales, uh, you know, as you say, without sales, nothing, nothing happens. So, uh, and don't don't move away from those basics. The basics of looking after the customer, understanding the customer, the R factor, frequency times quality of con contact, and then all these great books you've you've been talking about uh, as well. Let alone activity input output. And uh, impact, David. Is there anything we haven't covered you'd like to cover? Any question I haven't asked you, um, you'd like me to cover before we before we wrap up? Three things. Yes. That we missed out. Number one, very very simple. Pick the phone up within three rings. Yeah. We all know what it's like for that. There's no. It's it's not personal today when you phone up companies, is it? You're stuck on a machine, you talk to a machine, you wait on yeah. a machine. Um, now, one is, you know, pick the phone up in 24 hours. You know, respond to customers in 24 hours as well, internally and externally. Don't keep people waiting. Yeah. The greatest thing that slows down an organization is slow decision-making, and that's everyone holding on to something for 48 hours. You you multiply that by six people, and you've all of a sudden you've got, you know, five days of delays. Yeah, yeah. Just very, very simple stuff like that. And don't tolerate it, you know, because as Mahatma Gandhi said, the customer is the most, most important visitor on our planet. He's not an outsider. He's the purpose of it, right? So if we don't have customers, we don't have a business. So why wouldn't we want to treat them mm. well? Mm. The other one is simplicity. It's the art of sophistication. You know, simplicity is the hardest thing in the world to do. Complexity equals confusion, which is the enemy of trust and value. It's really difficult to simplify your systems, your processes, but keep working on it all the time because complexity is just cost. It's time. Beautiful. Complexity third, is cost and time. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And the third one there. You see, you complexity equals confusion, which is the... Um, the enemy of trust and value. If people are confused and it's complicated, they don't understand it, they won't trust it. Yeah, that was the guy from Asda that actually told me that used to work for Walmart. We did 900 transactions for Walmart per day in China. I mean, you know, that's that's moving fast. You know, I've worked in supply chains where the cows milked in the morning and it's on in the retail store within 48 hours. I mean, these are fast supply chains, FMCG. I've been in that all my life. So it's just quick decision making, getting things moving. And and because if you don't, you don't get your daily milk and bread. 
Mm-hmm. And you don't want the milk and bread 10 days later. It's not quite the same. So is there yeah, anything else you want to share? Well, I suppose uh, I, I suppose the other one, you know, when you look back in life, you know, seven rules, you know, find a mentor. You know, if young people, find a mentor, someone you really look up to that you can talk to in a safe environment like the good chats that we have. You know, have two or three sort of mentors and, and coaches in life. You know, number two, gratitude. Every time you see someone you like or you see something that's nice, compliment them on it. Say, you know, it'll make them feel good and it'll make you feel good. Yeah, number three, connect. You know, work on connecting with the people that make you happy and put your energy into those relationships because they will inspire you, they'll motivate you, you benchmark, benchmark each other. These are your true friends. Right? The other one is, you know, good friends at, at every stage. You know, work on your friends, your value system, your network. Um, always stick up for your beliefs, irrespective of your belief in your people or your group. Always stick up for them. Um, there's nothing new in life, right? As I said before, everything's been done before. Life's not meant to be easy. No one's in charge except you. And and finally, attitude. You know, attitude, I've always said it to my, you know, wonderful daughter, Zuri, as you know, it's a little thing that makes a big difference because it's all in here. And the brain is the most powerful chemical factory in the world. Why do you think the placebo effect on many pharmaceuticals and drugs and even vaccines is up to 40%? People are given blanks, but because they've told their brain that it's true, it is true. It's incredible, isn't it? The power, the power of the brain. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. David, this has been absolutely fantastic, mate. I'm so glad we've been trying meaning to do this for months now, but the fact we've finally done it is just brilliant, mate. To one, reflect back on that marvellous time, uh, the one plus one is five, I think we created at BSI, but at all the fantastic things you've done, uh, I've got your resume here, all of those fantastic things you've done, but all the difference you'll continue to make sitting on boards and the advising and the mentoring you'll do. I'll put your contact details, and of course people can contact you via LinkedIn. You're on LinkedIn, aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. So people can contact you on LinkedIn and it'll also be attached to this this podcast. Mate, anything else you want to say before we before we wind up? Thank you very much, uh, Lee. That's all I want to say. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for reaching out. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed this discussion. No notes, no rehearsal. It's just uh, come out as it was. So I'm a little bit, you know, sorry if I haven't been well prepared, but... Uh, um, Mate, you've been been brilliant. Mate, even when you're unprepared, you look prepared. There's no doubt about it. You're such a Mm -hmm. professional. Mate, Mm -hmm. I appreciate what we've done today. Uh, I look forward to us staying in touch. Of course, we will. Let's see it sooner or later. We'll do some great work again together, I'm sure. Thanks, mate. See you later. Bye. Thanks, mate. Bye.